Thank, thank you very much, Mary. And I want to second uh, what Mary said. You know, as, as chairman of the board, she has to say it's the greatest presidential library. I am not on the board, so I don't have to say it, but I will say it. Uh, I did, uh, when I was on the board of the Truman Library, I got to go. Uh, Mike Devine took me, uh, the, uh, the director of the library, took me to uh, uh, Washington. I got to sub for uh, whoever was our member of the uh, uh, Presidential Libraries Committee in Washington. And, uh, and I got to sit at the table with the, the delegates from all the other presidential libraries. The only time I've ever had this experience where they all wanted to sit near me because I represented the Truman Library. Usually at meetings like that, people go to the other end of the table. And uh, it, 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 we are viewed in the presidential library, in the rarefied circles of presidential libraries as, as the best presidential library, the best educational programs, uh, and great exhibits. So it's a wonderful thing to go and see if you haven't done it lately. I also want to thank the Kauffman Foundation, uh, which uh, uh, is responsible in large measure for this auditorium, for the relationship that we have with the uh, Truman Library for these great programs, and a lot of the, the rest of the library's uh, great programs. And so we are very grateful to them. I do want to mention a couple upcoming programs, which particularly this, uh, uh, this group interested in, uh, in history uh, uh, and in First Ladies will we, we'll probably want to know about. We will continue this series uh, on June 5th uh, with a, a First Lady who was who was not a spouse, uh, but, uh, but a child, uh, or uh, she was an adult child, uh, Martha Jefferson Randolph, uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson's daughter, who acted as his first lady uh, in, the, in the White House, Patsy, uh, Patsy Jefferson, Patsy Jefferson Randolph, um, and, and uh, uh, Cynthia Kerner will be talking about her. Um, we have some, uh, some wonderful programs uh, about and by and with women uh, coming up uh, over the, uh, uh, the next uh, a few weeks, and I'll mention a couple of them. Uh, John Blundell uh, will be talking about Ladies for Liberty, uh, Women Who Made a Difference in American History. We'll include a couple of First Ladies, I think, as well as Rosa Parks and Ann Hutchison and, and, uh, uh, and many of the great women in American uh, history, uh, and that will be on uh, Monday, May 13th uh, at the Central Library. Um, we have an ongoing conversation with entrepreneurs, and we, we are co-sponsoring a series that, that is a part of that larger series of interviewing Kansas City entrepreneurs with the Central Exchange, uh, the, the, uh, the, the women's club downtown. Um, and uh, we'll kick that off with a conversation with the first lady of political public relations, Roshan Paris, uh, Paris Communications here in Kansas City. But Roshan, as some of you will know, but many of you won't, Roshan is one of the leading uh, staff people, the, the contract staff people for uh, the Democratic Party in the United States. Uh, she worked for the Clintons, for, for Hillary and Bill, uh, some of Hillary's uh, famous trips as first lady to China, for instance, uh, were advanced by Roshan. Uh, the, the, our current president's uh, trips to, uh, to Africa and Asia, uh, Roshan has been the key uh, principal advance person. Uh, she's also been the key pr uh, PR person for uh, companies you might have heard of like uh, Hallmark and Sprint. And so uh, that, that will be very interesting, and that'll be on Wednesday, uh, May 15th, and you'll hear, hear the, the truth about, about Bill, uh, Barry, Hillary, the, you know, the whole crew. Actually, I, I think she'll clam up on me, but we'll see. I'm going to be a tough. Going to be tough. Um, and then last but not least, I, I do want to mention uh, a program. We're already almost sold out for it, but I want to mention it because I think it's very important uh, and, and could be an important moment in the conversation about education in Kansas City. Michelle Ree, uh, the former superintendent of Washington, D.C. schools, controversial figure, uh, now uh, running an organization called Students First, will be here for a conversation with me uh, here at the Plaza Library on uh, May 22nd. Um, and uh, uh, I promise if there are any union members here, I will ask her some tough questions. Uh, and for all those of you who are interested in reform of American education, it will be, I think, a very interesting uh, conversation. So now to tonight. Um, I am so glad that we have uh, Michael Gillette uh, here with us with uh, his Lady Bird Johnson uh, oral history and, and talking about her, and for a couple of different reasons. First, I, I heard him, I think, on NPR, or saw him on C-SPAN, or whatever it was, and I, and I was fascinated by his, uh, his take on Lady Bird. I think Lady Bird uh, Johnson invented the, the role of the modern first lady. I mean, she obviously owed a lot to Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, but Eleanor Roosevelt was, uh, was something of a sport in the history of, of first ladies, and, 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 and uh, 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 Mamie Eisenhower and Bess Truman uh, weren't really, didn't really follow in her footsteps. 
Uh, Jackie Kennedy obviously uh, did, uh, did, did a unique thing, uh, but it was very specific to her personality. Lady Bird, I think, invented the modern first lady, uh, uh, creating a, a program or, or beautification program uh, that became a national program uh, that she devoted her time to, um, and, and, and also in the way that she deeply, uh, passionately uh, supported her husband and that uh, uh, in his entire political career uh, and became a part of that political career, not, not simply uh, an ornament, not simply uh, the, uh, uh, representing the, the family and American life uh, kind of thing that uh, First Ladies had before, but, uh, but, but representing a key part of his political team, which is something if you, if you buy and read this book, which I would urge you to do, and it is for sale from our friends at Reading Reptile uh, out in the hall, um, uh, it, 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 it describes uh, in detail, uh, she describes in detail with the questions from Michael Gillette and his successor uh, in these 47 interviews, uh, the deep involvement she had with his political campaign. And, and uh, the, the 1948 uh, political campaign, uh, uh, the famous one where he ran for the Senate against the, uh, Governor Koch Stevenson uh, in the primary uh, and won by a tiny, tiny margin, and, and her deep involvement in that. It also describes, the, 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 this book describes the, the very, very personal nature of politics. I love the story. There is a story uh, that she tells in her interview uh, with uh, uh, Professor Gillette uh, about uh, uh, the appointment uh, by uh, Harry Truman of their good friend, Fred Vinson, as Chief Justice of the United States. Um, and, and the point of the story, actually, is, is a very personal one. Um, he really wanted it. His wife, Roberta, who was a very close friend of Lady Bird's and of Lyndon's, didn't want it. She was looking at the, uh, the chance that they might get out of Washington or stay in Washington in the private sector and make some money. Um, and, uh, and so uh, the, the, the president calls Vincent in and appoints him uh, to the chief justiceship. He's pretty excited about it, but he knows his wife is going to be very unhappy. But traffic is heavy. He doesn't get back home before it's on the radio. And he comes, he comes to find her sobbing in bed. She's taken to her bed and she's sobbing because there, there goes the, the, uh, the, the money for retirement, the money to handle illness, the, you know, uh, the country clubs, et cetera. And, uh, and, and Lyndon is called in, Lyndon calls everyone in, and finally Lady Bird has to show up to, uh, uh, to solve this problem with Roberta Vincent. It's a fabulous story, and there are many, many, many fabulous stories like this, some of which I'm sure we'll hear from, uh, from Michael Gillette tonight. It, it's a great look at the inside of politics, the inside uh, of what turns out to be a much more human story than we're given on the front pages. Uh, uh, Michael Gillette uh, is a, a, a Texan by, uh, by birth as well as, I think, by passion, from what I can tell. Um, born in uh, San Antonio, uh, he got his PhD from the University of Texas in 1984, has been on the staff of the, uh, that second best presidential library, the LBJ Presidential Library. Uh, as chief of oral history and acquisitions, which is how he began to do uh, 600 oral history interviews, including 37 of the 47 oral histories uh, 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 with Lady Bird. Uh, he's done them uh, with uh, Hubert Humphrey, Russell Long, Sergeant Shriver, Larry O'Brien, Joe Califano, Ellsworth Bunker, et, et cetera. Um, uh, he, he, uh, the National Archives stole him back to Washington uh, where he became the director of uh, the Center for Legislative Archives in, at the National Archives, there, thereby in charge of the uh, Senate Archives uh, and the House Archives, um, and eventually returned to Austin as the director, the executive director of Humanities Texas, uh, the state affiliate of the, uh, the National Endowment, much as our uh, Missouri uh, Humanities uh, Council is the uh, Missouri version of that. Uh, uh, he's, he's, he's put together a really uh, wonderful book and has a wonderful story to tell about Lady Bird Johnson, who I believe invented the role of the modern first lady, Michael Gillette. Thank you. It's an honor to be here tonight. Uh, thanks to our hosts, the uh, Truman Library Institute and the Kansas City Public Library. I'm honored to, to be part of this series. Uh, having been channeling Lady Bird Johnson for the last six months, 
I'm almost certain that if she were here tonight, she would begin by saying how much she admired President Truman. In her oral history, she compared President Truman to Moses, a prophet who led the country toward a new promised land of equal justice and affordable health care for seniors. She had great respect for President Truman, as did LBJ. The, uh, the topic of this series, uh, First Ladies, Beyond the Gowns, uh, inspires an observation. In the case of Lady Bird Johnson, it's not easy to move beyond the gowns. <laughs> and, and that is because uh, the gowns won't stay in the closet. They keep coming out of the closet. When you have two daughters and seven granddaughters, these gowns have taken on a life of their own. And uh, the, uh, the granddaughters especially love to show their uh, affection for their late grandmother by wearing some of her dresses uh, to uh, various events and activities. So uh, the gowns are much in evidence in my world. Um, as Crosby indicated, uh, uh, we began these oral histories with Mrs. Johnson uh, years ago. Uh, really in, in 1977, when I was uh, uh, still a very young uh, uh, budding historian, and she was approximately my age now. And the interviews uh, continued over a span of 18 years. Uh, they formed the, the narrative of this book, Lady Bird Johnson, An Oral History, because the book really is her story in her own words. And there are three concurrent tracks in this book. One track presents her observations, her portraits of the events and personalities that shaped our modern world. Uh, just as a, as a witness participant in Washington and Texas for 40 years, she watched and uh, remembered and then told me in these interviews about many of these things that she witnessed. Really, a, a great deal of American history passed before her eyes. A couple of examples. She boarded President Truman's uh, campaign uh, train in 1948 when it came through Austin and had recollections of that. She sat in the House gallery when uh, General Douglas MacArthur gave his famous uh, Old Soldiers Never Die speech. And she was in the Washington Armory in March uh, 1952 when President Truman uh, delivered a bombshell that he wouldn't seek re-election. Uh, and that, of course, influenced uh, LBJ in 1968. Uh, the second track as Crosby suggested, is the uh, phenomenal political rise of Lyndon Johnson through a combination of good fortune, consummate political skill and resourcefulness, and uh, incredibly hard work. And you see all of these factors uh, uh, up close and personal in Mrs. Johnson's oral history. But the third and most compelling track is the transformation of a shy young Southern country girl into one of the most admired and effective first ladies in American history. And this is the track that I want to visit with you about uh, this evening. Um, <clears throat> this transformation really came into focus to me in the spring of 1978 I was sitting in my office at the other great presidential library, the LBJ <laughs> Library, and, and uh, my phone rang and it was Mrs. Johnson. And I remember her opening words were, hello Mike, how would you like to do something zany? And I thought, what could she possibly mean by zany? And she explained, she invited me to accompany her to her 50th high school reunion at Marshall High School in, in Deep East Texas. And of course, I jumped at the chance to go, along with Liz Carpenter. And uh, this trip was really a remarkable adventure in time travel. 
to see her with uh, <clears throat> people that she'd gone to high school with 50 years ago, it just brought out all of her, her youthful vigor and, and warmth. Um, and they were thrilled to see her. And of course, she enjoyed being in their company. Uh, but she was no longer that shy country girl who dreaded the prospect of having to give a, a high school graduation speech and was vastly relieved when two of her classmates outranked her, sparing her that uh, terrible assignment. Uh, at the reunion, she gave a wonderful talk, uh, filled with humor and nostalgia about the times that they had shared together. But the trip also included stops at some significant landmarks from her youth. We, uh, we went to the Brick House, the, the antebellum uh, plantation house where, where she had been born in Karnak. And uh, we, uh, we stopped at the little country cemetery in Scottsville where her mother was buried when Lady Bird was only five years old. And finally, we uh, climbed into John Boats and ventured out into Caddo Lake with its majestic uh, cypress trees laden with Spanish moss. And that brought into focus what a spectacular setting she had grown up in. And it was easy to see how her love of nature and natural beauty was fostered in this gorgeous setting. And, and she attributes her love of, of beauty to spending all that time in the, in the forest and in Caddo Lake around uh, Karnak. But that setting also imposed a tremendous isolation. She didn't have many friends. Uh, there weren't many children her age. Uh, there weren't many adults her age either. Uh, and that imposed isolation really instilled a self-reliance in her. And it also instilled a love of reading. She became a voracious reader, and that served her well in later life. Uh, now, I want to fast forward, and let's look in on Claudia Taylor's life in 1934. Mid-1934, she has just graduated from the University of Texas with her second degree, this one in journalism. The first one had been in history. She's also earned a teaching certificate, and uh, so she could be a school teacher, and she's taken typing and shorthand courses so that she can be a secretary. But um, she has no career plans. When I asked her in the interview what, what she planned to do, was she going to be a reporter or a school teacher or was she going to be a secretary? She said, I didn't have any plans. I was just going to go where fate led me, almost as if she was a spectator in her own life. And uh, what was lacking was ambition, the kind of ambition that gives direction and drive and purpose to life. She was smart. She was conscientious, but she, didn't, she wasn't really motivated to do one thing and thought perhaps she might get married. But all this changed in September 1934, September 5th to be exact. She went to visit a friend in the state capitol, and while she was there, there was a chance encounter. A young man named Lyndon Johnson walked in. They went and had drinks. <clears throat> he invited her to have breakfast with him the next morning, and then uh, they rode around Austin all day, and it was on that drive that he asked her to marry him. <clears throat> Rather sudden, not wasting time. And I'm going to let you hear her description of that whirlwind courtship. And this is about a two-hour conversation, but it's only going to take about five minutes, but you're going to hear her uh, mixed emotions in, uh, in confronting Lyndon Johnson for the first time. So play track one, if you will. I know there was something electric going, and that he did ask me to have breakfast with him the next morning. Mm -hmm. And that um, I was sort of unsure whether I wanted to or not, and um, didn't call to, to, to make it firm. Um, 
and I started by to, to see Hugo Cuny, whose office was next door to the Driscoll. And there was Lyndon sitting in the dining room uh, on the other side of this big plate glass window where I was just walking past and he looked up and <laughs> flagged me down and he was there waiting for me and I don't know whether psychologically I intended to, all the time I meant to go or not. In any case, it was a, a near miss. After breakfast and somehow after the architect and, and he had his bag, we did get in his car and ride and ride and ride and he did a great deal of talking. Um, well, how was he different from the other young men that you knew at this point? Was there anything distinctive about him that struck you right off? Well, he came on strong and he was um, uh, uh, very, very um, direct and uh, dynamic and you just had a sense of this is um, I didn't know quite what to make of him. Did you sense that magnetism? I did, very, quite, uh, quite clearly. And I do believe before the day was over, he did ask me to marry him, and I thought he was just out of his mind. I mean, I, I just, I just, uh, uh, it was, it was very. Uh, I'm a slow, considered sort of person generally, and certainly not uh, uh, given to quick conclusions, uh, much rash behavior. <laughs> and, um... Do you remember where you were when he proposed? Were you still riding around in the time? We, we were, and we rode around all day long, and during part of it, we did drive around to some of my favorite haunts, which mm -hmm. were uh, the uh, lovely little country roads around Austin where there were these clear streams running over uh, uh, the white rocks and the chalky limestone and um, it was exciting. It was ex intensely exciting, also a little bit frightening because uh, I uh, was far from sure I wanted to know him any better. <laughs> well, do you remember where you were this, when he proposed? No, I don't. Um, was it? It was on the first day. That I, I do believe it was. It sounds absolutely too outrageous, but he has said so many times himself, and I think he was correct. <laughs> Read that. When he proposed, you didn't say yes and you didn't say no. No, I didn't. I just sat there with my mouth open, <laughs> kind of. <laughs> well, so he pursued her for two and a half months, and finally, uh, after a madcap ride across Texas from, from deep east Texas to San Antonio, she relented, and uh, her, her normal caution was... Uh, was overwhelmed by Lyndon Johnson. Um, now, if opposites do attract, there was indeed something electric going on, as she phrased it, when they met, because you could not have imagined two people more opposite. Uh, she was conservative, cautious, and judicious, and he was liberal, impulsive, and always in a hurry. Um, her calm and, and gracious, shy demeanor contrasted with his rather volatile, uh, uh, demanding uh, uh, temperament. <laughs> While she was thrifty, he was given to acts of extravagant generosity. And if she was essentially private and, and self-reliant, he desperately needed people around him always. Um, and so we might ask, what did she see in Lyndon Johnson that caused her to override this, this innate caution? The people I interviewed that had known Lyndon Johnson in the 1930s recalled how attractive and dynamic he was and how exciting it was to be around him as a, when he was a young man. And exciting was the way she summarized their first day together. But there was another factor, and that was his just 
his drive, his forcefulness, his raw, honest ambition. She wrote him a letter during this courtship period, and she said, I adore you for being so ambitious. He was, provide, he was filling a need that she didn't have. He gave her the, the sense of purpose and direction. And she talks about that sense of purpose in the next track. After they had been in Washington less than a year as a newlywed couple, he uh, was appointed to the, the state director of the National Youth Administration, a new deal agency to, to get young people and keep them in school and, and get them employed. And this was a very demanding job that had him crisscrossing crossing the state, working day and night. And I asked her if this meant that they didn't get enough, to spend enough time together. And uh, you're going to hear her response now. Track two. You didn't have enough time together during this? I mean, it seems like you must have been working all the time. We certainly didn't have much time together. But then, um, fortunately, I was always independent, fairly. And, um, and I did not feel deprived or, or mad at the job or mad at him. And I, I, I always felt that each job we were in was a significant job. And uh, Mayor Tom Miller used to have a saying, something like each of us is uh, in search of the significant. And uh, it, it was satisfying and it was significant. And I, I, I wanted it to succeed. I liked being part of it. Oh, I must say I had a, a mighty small role. Well. If I had to do over again, I think I would have uh, learned more about it and tried to be more part of it. Uh, I stop. That's well. Uh, the, the stop it. That's the third track. Of the new, new Thank you. Hold, hold that track. That comes later. <laughs> Thank you. They're close together. You have a lot to work with when you have 47 interviews. <laughs> um, Mrs. Johnson referred to LBJ as a regular Henry Higgins, explaining that uh, he stretched me as he stretched everyone around him, challenging her to do more than she thought was possible. And this really contributed significantly to her transformation. I'll give you about four examples. The first one, when he went on active duty in the Navy in 1942, he enlisted Lady Bird to run his congressional office. And this meant that she went to the office every day, met with constituents, met with uh, executive branch uh, officials, studied legislation, uh, uh, dealt with everything a congressman does except vote. She couldn't vote. And in doing so, she not only learned a great deal about his world and an appreciation for the, the world and those people in it, but she also developed a great sense of self-confidence that she had lacked. She'd never had a job before. She'd never had to do anything before. This gave her the confidence to move back to Austin the following year when they bought a television or radio station and reorganize and manage that station during the transition. And that the station, of course, became the foundation of their uh, financial empire but it was Lady Bird Johnson who went back and took that job on, learning that industry from scratch and, and making it a successful station. Then there's her role in his campaigns. She was basically shut out of his first campaign for Congress in 1937 because the campaign manager didn't believe that women should be involved. But she became increasingly active in each of his successive campaigns, uh, overcoming, finally, her shyness about speaking in public, conquering that fear, and uh, going around the state campaigning for him. If you read the chapter on the, the uh, cliffhanger 1948-87 vote campaign, I think you will conclude, as I did, that Lyndon Johnson would not have run, won that election had it not been for her. First, keeping him in the campaign when he wanted to drop out, 
and then finally traveling around the state mobilizing groups of women to turn out for him and support him. Um, the last example comes in the early 50s when LBJ felt the need to sort of burnish his image as a, uh, as a Western persona, a rancher. And to do that, he, uh, without bothering to discuss this with Mrs. Johnson, went out and purchased the dilapidated LBJ ranch from his widow, widowed aunt. Well, guess who was assigned the task of moving back again to Austin to renovate this ranch? And uh, she took, again, she took that assignment on and interviewed the foreman and, and learned about ranch life. Um, and this is a woman that has two daughters she's raising. She has a house in Washington and a house in Austin and now a ranch in Johnson City or Stonewall and a, tele a radio station. So this is multitasking, plus the fact that she's got her husband's political career and she's a very active participant in that. But the more Lyndon Johnson relied on her, the more he depended on her, the greater her influence became and the more important she became to, in his life. Um, I'm gonna let you hear one last example of her audio uh, interviews. And this is where she persuades him to buy a house. They'd been married for eight years and had just gone from one rental to the next and she finally insists that they buy a house. Play the track three now. I haunted uh, the, the real estate portion of the newspaper. And Sunday afternoon was the time to ride around and look at the possibilities. Lyndon and John Connolly and I were riding around to see one that I had been advertised out in, uh, right off of Connecticut Avenue uh, in Ellicott Hills, as it was called, at 4921 30th Place Northwest. Um, I wanted to buy it immediately, partly as the result of having um, uh, waited so long, and, and partly because I thought, um, the, uh, by the time I finished doing uh, what I wanted to with it, it would acquire charm, and it had so many basics. Um, I walked out of the house thinking that we had really agreed to buy it. As we drove down the street, I said, uh, uh, Linda, when are you going to give him a check? Uh, and Linda said, well, we're not going to buy it. And, and I burst into tears, which were very angry tears, <laughs> something I practically never uh, did. And I said, all I've got to look forward to is one more damn campaign. <laughs> and I really uh, let him know what I thought of, uh, of the 14 or so moves we had made. Uh, and the, uh, let me see, how many years of marriage would that be by that time? From 30, about, about eight, mm -hmm. close to eight. So he looked shocked, and John looked at him and kind of grinned and said, I think you better go back and buy that house. <laughs> <laughs> and they did. The house in 30th place in Washington proved to be a very important addition to their lives because uh, now LBJ started bringing home all of his political friends, uh, fellow members of Congress, senators, people from Texas. Uh, occasionally, Mrs. Johnson would get a telephone call that uh, I'm bringing 12 people home for dinner tonight, be ready. And fortunately, she had this wonderful cook from Marshall, Texas, Zephyr Wright, who, who's fabulous comfort food attracted the likes of Sam Rayburn and Dick Russell and many other people who were very influential in the advancement of LBJ's career. But having those uh, often unscheduled dinners for 12 or 14 kept Lady Bird Johnson at the center of LBJ's political world. Very often she would be the only woman there with, uh, with uh, key members of Congress and others. Um, 
and and so that was uh, that was certainly important to her. It's it's what she described as the society that he thrust me into, and at the nucleus it was sort of the Texas establishment in Washington, but it was also all of the clubs that the spouses of congressmen belonged to. There was the 75th club and the 81st club, depending on what Congress your husband had been elected to. And there was the congressional club that included everyone. And then there was the Senate ladies club. Well, these organizations gave Mrs. Johnson an opportunity to spend a great deal of time with women who were very sophisticated, very intelligent, and had a great deal of experience to share. This was a, a significant factor in her education. Um, she basically participated in an ongoing virtual salon for 30 years, every week, sometimes two or three days a week, interacting with these very bright women who had seen a great deal of the world. So if you take this apprenticeship as a congressional spouse, as a Senate spouse, and then as a very active stand-in for First Lady Jacqueline Kennedy during the vice presidential years, we see that Lady Bird Johnson entered the White House as one of the most prepared First Ladies in U.S. history. She used to say that she found herself on stage playing a role for which she had never rehearsed. And well, maybe that's true, but she had certainly prepared for it. Just being in Washington that long, being that close to politics, knowing when to be discreet and when not to, knowing how to utilize your position as First Lady effectively, how to use that capital to get things done, how to persuade people to do what they ought to do. Um, so when she entered the White House, she assembled a professional staff in the East Wing, really the first high-powered professional staff of a First Lady. She also recruited legions of very influential women and men to beautify and conserve the nation's environment. They started with the nation's capital and created a spectacular showcase in Washington so that millions of tourists could see what was possible in their own hometowns. And then she took this effort on the road and traveled uh, around the country to highlight the scenic beauty and also the threats to its environment. Beautification was a term that she was never happy with. She said they never could find a better term but it was just one thread in a larger tapestry that included clean air and clean water, green space, urban parks, cultural heritage tourism, and additions to our system of natural, national parks. And yet her environmental legacy was only one facet of her leadership. She continued uh, Mrs. Kennedy's uh, effort to secure period uh, authentic furnishings and, and period art for the White House. And in the fall of 1964, uh, she aborted the Lady Bird Special and campaigned through the South for LBJ, becoming the first First Lady in history to campaign independently for her husband. She organized uh, women doers luncheons at the at the White House to recognize the achievements of notable women. Uh, she embraced Project Head Start and gave it the prominence of a White House launch and that had a, that had a lot to do with the success of that program. Um, she also participated gracefully in scores of presidential foreign trips state dinners, and many other act, social activities, including two White House weddings. And at the same time, she provided LBJ with an island of peace during that very turbulent, uh, heady decade of the 1960s. For historians, she also compiled or dictated a diary, a White House diary of 1,750,000 words. Now tell me that's not discipline to do all of that at the end of the day. So 
How would we summarize Lady Bird Johnson? Liz Carpenter once observed that Mrs. Johnson was wise to pick beautification as a cause because it's so visible. It's something we can see and enjoy all around us. Uh, Mrs. Johnson was always unfailingly modest in uh, assessing her own achievements. The way she expressed it was, I just made a lot of little lists and checked them off one by one. But she did concede that LBJ valued her judgment and that they were better together than they would have been apart. Um, my own take is that she was a strong, smart uh, Southern woman of remarkable warmth, grace, and sensitivities to the needs of others. Her self-discipline, resilience, and uh, great unerring good judgment served her very well in public life, but she never lost that youthful modesty that she'd had as a country girl in Karnak, and she'd never lost her extraordinary capacity for friendship, and it was really my great good fortune to experience that friendship. Thank you.